I am at the moment in Cusco, Peru. Wow, 10,000 feet. I've been there. Indeed, 10,000 feet. Yeah, very high. Yeah. You're, uh, you're, you're acclimated. Know. You're obviously acclimated. Yeah, I've been here for the past month. I've been taking, uh, you know, I'm taking, I've been taking intensive courses at an institute here in uh, Cusco for Spanish. So that's what I've been doing here. And then I'm heading back to the jungle tonight, actually. Uh, wonderful. Uh, how, yeah. how's, cool, cool now? Is it, uh, what's your weather? It's always cool in Cusco. It's always sunny. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like fall weather in Boston. You know, it's sunny and it's sunny and warm, basically. You know, not, not warm, but it's like, you know, 55, 60. So I, I like it because it's not, you know, the jungle can be quite oppressive at times and it's in the heat. So Cusco is like a brisk fall day in Boston. It's, it's nice. It's like sweater weather, basically, always. Yeah, and a, and a beautiful city, old ones. I've beautiful. been there yeah, a million years ago, but I love it. So uh, today we're going to talk about cancel culture. Indeed, indeed we are. Uh, you know, it's been, first of all, I, ne I didn't even understand the term. So can you help us both? I mean, help the audience and me by what the heck does it mean? Sure. Well, this is something that's been something that's interested in me. And I, I, I've tried to interpret it on, on a few different levels. Uh, most recently in my book that just was released called Rene Girard and COVID-19. And Girard was a, a French anthropologist who not necessarily uh, interested in cancel culture because Girard passed away before that term was even, you know, known by the collective psyche. But he was interested in, um, in kind of, you could say, anthropological or ancient forms of cancel culture. And of course, the most primal form of cancel culture is sacrifice. That is the original cancel culture. So what, what we have today in 21st century American culture and really global culture, in 21st century globalization and global capitalism and digital culture, um, the phenomenon of cancel culture is a, is a term that is used to express um, the underlying dynamics of sacrifice. And of course, you know, people aren't being literally, you know, they're, they're not being put on an Aztec uh, temple and, and being sacrificed to the gods, but in a, in a, in a structural way or in a, or in a conceptual way, that's almost exactly what's happening. Um, when you see these incidents on Twitter or, you know, and we should say cancel culture is something that is happening constantly in various degrees and intensities, you know, like there might be somebody on Twitter and, you know, living in Idaho who has, you know, 200 followers and maybe there's an incident in this hometown and he's ganged up on by 50 people. I mean, that's a, that is an example of cancel culture, but what we tend to see are these big, huge explosive moments that reach the collective consciousness. Like for instance, what happened um, a couple of years ago with the, high school students from Covington, Kentucky, um, and, their, and the, their kind of conflict with the indigenous activist, Nathan Phillips. Like that was an exemplary example of cancel culture in the sense that we all knew about it. We all saw what happened. And I think recently too, well, you know, what, what happened in Boston a, a few days ago to that, you know, that poor 21 year old kid who threw a bottle of water at Kyrie Irving. And the next thing you know, it's like he committed a war crime or he, he, he you know, he, he's, he's like some kind of Nazi war criminal. And I mean, it's, and, you know, like the whole media ecology of Boston and, you know, a, a huge segment of the, of the Twitter community ganged up on this poor kid. I mean, he did, I mean, of course he shouldn't have thrown the bottle of water, but I mean, give me a break. You, know, you throw a bottle of water and, and you're, you're called a, uh, you know, some kind of war criminal or, you know, committed a hate crime. I mean, it's, it's crazy. So um, these, these instances, um, uh, cancel culture is, in my, the way I would interpret it, it's a, it's, it has at its core a sacrificial logic in the sense that people find a potential victim. And when I use the term victim, somebody that says something wrong, somebody does something wrong, or, or maybe even somebody who says a profound truth that is not accepted by the community. And they gang up on the, on, on the individual and they essentially discharge or release all of their own toxic emotions, all of their own resentments, all of their own anger, and they project it onto the victim. And that, that is, you know, we're gonna get into this over the next hour or so, but that, that is like the basic elementary structure of cancel culture. It is the 
process of a community discharging its own internal problems, internal tensions, internal anger, internal emotional dysfunction onto a selected scapegoat, onto a selected victim. And, you know, cancel culture is not, this is the, the problem that I have with cancel culture. Yes, it does in um, our contemporary political conditions tend to emerge usually from the left, but it, it also emerges from the right too. But the point that we should see is that it's not really a political thing. It's much more of a, a human thing or an anthropological thing that we're all potentially suspect to doing. Um, and, you know, I mean, like, you know, you, th you think about a, a bully in a schoolyard. I mean, and, you know, he, he gets his friends and they pick. I mean, that's a that's an example of cancel culture. So can cancel culture has a it's it. What is new about cancel culture? It's, you know, cancel culture in many ways is the oldest thing in the world. It's like, you know, human societies like slave societies and these 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 ancient cultures that organize themselves around victimizing certain groups of people. I mean, that's cancel culture. What's new is the fact that we can now see it so clearly. The fact that it's so close to us in our smartphones, in our social media feeds, and we're able to see, um, hello? Yeah, I'm here. Oh yeah, and, and we're able to see just how disgusting it is and just how wrong it is. So that's that's a you know of course we can we can expand on that but that's a basic way that I would see it. Okay, and I'm gonna um, play and and really I'm looking solely I'm not this is not a rhetorical question I'm looking solely for information. So is it a culture that decides to cancel other cultures that are not their culture, or is it just a whole culture of uh, people the, the frenzy we're seeing now of one group you know, trying to cancel the other group. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think cancel culture can happen on multiple levels. It can happen, for instance, look at what happened during World War II when the Jews, I mean, excuse me, when the, when the Nazis engaged in a systematic cancellation of the Jewish population. Or, okay. you know, look what happened. You know, bo both of us come from Irish Catholic backgrounds. I mean, look at the colonial history of Ireland for, you know, a thousand years. It was systematically canceled by... The British colonial rulers. Look right. at look at what happened to African American people from 1619 to 1865. Their whole lives, their whole existence, their whole culture was systematically canceled by the political economy of the Southern states. Um, but cancel culture is again, it's not something that necessarily only happens on that kind of macro level. We do it ourselves. We, we do it all the time on an individual level. Like think about it in a family dynamic at a, you know, a family Christmas dinner when everyone gangs up on one cousin or one uncle or whatever. I mean, cancel culture is something that's very embedded into the structure of the human psyche in the structure of human community in the sense that we, we try to dis, dis, dislodge or unload or be free of our internal dysfunction, our own resentments, our own angers, our own emotional problems, whatever. And the way we usually do that is by trying to put it on somebody, by projecting it onto somebody. And that is, in its most elementary sense, an act of cancellation. Again, what is happening now, the fact that we see this happening on Twitter, on social media, and we see how gross it is, what's funny about that not 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 funny it's it's horrible it's it's terrible it's it's so wrong no matter no matter who is doing it but what is what we find what we find so repulsive about it is precisely the fact that we're not in touch with how we do it ourselves that's why we find it so disgusting because we don't want to see how we do it ourselves you know what i mean and and i think that one of the good things about cancel culture and i and, and i say this in, in a very uh, broad sense is that maybe it can make us realize and come to grips with the way our societies and our economies and our you know, basic interpersonal relationships are organized to try to become, to, you, to, to try to develop our consciousness and develop our spiritual capacity so we don't engage in this kind of behavior. But you know, the thing that I always find remarkable is how people talk about cancel culture like it's new. It's like new. Like, what do you think ancient Greece was? Like, what do you think 
ancient indigenous communities were that sacrificed. I mean, cancel culture is like the, the zero point of humanity. It's, it's not new. What's new is the fact that we can see it on our smartphones. That's what's new. Nothing more. Yeah, I think it's so magnified between not just the social media, but the, the conventional media as, uh, yeah, it's, it's magnified. <laughs> I, you know, I've been around the planet 74 years. I've never seen it to this extent. In fact, there's a frenzy. It seems to consume all forms of media. They're fascinated by it. And so it escalates and escalates and escalates in that. So we've talked about this before in our other podcast, so that the real issues aren't addressed and the, you know, the issues of globalization and, and uh, gentrification and everything else, just the, 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 the tides, you know, it's like a huge tsunami, just, you know, uh, taking out whole landscapes. Sure, sure. And, you know, one, again, one of, you know, when we come back to this basic definition of cancel culture, it's the act of cleansing ourselves, right? It's the act of unloading our own problems onto a chosen victim, onto a chosen scapegoat. And this in ancient societies was, an, was, was a purgative act, like sacrifice was something that you did to clear the community of its own internal problems. It was, it was a cleansing act. So what, what people don't realize is that when people in, like when you see these ridiculous pile-ons on Twitter and these kind of digital lynchings, what people don't often realize is that the people who are doing it, all the people who are ganging up, they're getting something out of that. And what they're getting is a sense of temporary cleansing, a, a temporary catharsis in the sense that they're unloading their own problems onto the victim. And, and they think that by doing that, they can cleanse themselves, but of course they can't. And, you know, one of the, you know, most religions teach us that. And specifically, I would say most definitely Christianity teaches us that because we see what happens like the, the whole narrative of Christianity revolves around how you shouldn't do that. Not, not only should you not do that because it's, you know, let's say immoral, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work because the problems just keep, come, keep coming back. So you have to engage in, you know, consciousness raising activities and spiritual development. So you don't engage in that kind of behavior. But um, that's the, the really interesting thing about, about cancel culture or, or sacrificial culture is that it's not just like, ah, let's be angry and, you know, beat up this guy. It's like, let's be angry and beat up this guy so we can be free of our own problems. So we can get rid of our own problems and put them onto the person that we're attacking. And well, that you know, is, yeah. you know, go ahead. No, when you mentioned Catholicism, that, I mean, Christianity, that is how it began, didn't it? With the sacrifices. Of course. Of course. I mean, Christy, I mean, and, and this is, you know, something I get into quite a bit in my book on Rene Girard. Girard was a, he was a very interesting guy. He was a French, French anthropologist who began his career as, as a literary critic, as a literary theorist. You know, he was reading Dostoevsky and Proust and Shakespeare. And what he discovered while reading this literature was like, like the, the, these kind of sacrificial dynamics that were in the text. And that brought him into anthropology and he started to investigate, you know, indigenous cultures and our archaic cultures that were organized around sacrifice. And finally, he comes to Christianity and he's like, oh, my God, he's like, I, I never realized what Christianity was really about in the sense that, yes, of course, Christianity is a theology. It's about God. But for Gerard, it's really about us. It's, it's what Christianity, what the Gospels teach us is not so much about God. It's about what we are and what we do and how cancel culture for, I mean, look at, I mean, I mean, my God, I mean, who was canceled more than Jesus Christ? I mean, he's the ultimate, I mean, Christianity is the, is the, is the story of cancel culture. I mean, it is cancel culture, but what's, what's different about cancel culture versus let's say, CN, excuse me, what's different about Christianity versus let's say CNN or Twitter or you know, the, the media ecology of 21st century capitalism is that Christianity says it's not good to do that. Whereas the media ecology of the 21st century just 
keeps us doing it in new and innovative ways, right? It, it never gets us to really stop and examine what we're doing and why we're doing it. We just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. Whereas Christianity, if you really read the gospels very closely, the way Gerard did, what we find out is that, I mean, cancel culture is wrong and that you shouldn't do it and, and, and not do it from a political. See, this is the thing about if you were to say, to like your average, let's say your average Fox News viewer, you know, you shouldn't be mad at liberals. You shouldn't try to cancel liberals. They might say, well, what are you talking about? Liberals are crazy. We have to do that. But that, and and that's why you can't interpret cancel culture strictly from a political viewpoint, because you'll always get into this kind of circular thing where like conservatives are wrong, liberals are wrong, whatever. It's like this, it's this never ending fight that no one ever wins. Whereas you view it from a anthropological perspective, the way I try to do it in my Rene Girard book is that you see it's not a political thing. It's a human thing. It, this is what we do. And the way to do it and, and, and the way to stop doing it is just a step away from the dynamic. You, you, have to, you have to surrender. You have to move away from the fight because this fight will just keep going on and on and on. So no one's going to win cancel culture. Like, like to, to think that like the right's going to win or the left's going to win is insane. Of course, because it's just gonna it's just gonna evolve into new forms. Cancel culture is the de facto state of humanity. It's like the Hobbesian war of all against all. What we learn, like I said, in most spiritual paths, and particularly Christianity, is that we have to remove ourselves from this anthropological dynamic and be, and become conscious of it. Right? We have to be aware of not only it from a let's say like a, a structural perspective in the sense of, of what's happening out there, but also what's happening in ourselves, how we also do it. You know what I mean? One of the thing, one of one, go ahead. one of the, go ahead. well, one, one of the great, one, of uh, one of the great moments, I think in the gospels um, that addresses something like cancel culture is in the gospel of John, when the woman's about to be stoned for being an adulterer. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, th 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 this is this is elementary cancel. This is elementary cancel culture. A group of people are about to pick up stones and kill us. I mean, it's really no different from a bunch of maniacs on Twitter about to go after somebody. The, the only difference is they're doing it with memes and tweets, whereas the, whereas in the old days they did it the real way with stones, right? And what Jesus says is, "Hey." Those among you without the first sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. And the, the, what's interesting to me is the way Gerard interprets this, or how you can interpret this from a Gerardian perspective, is that it's not what Jesus is saying is not simply like a moral thing, like, you know, don't, you know, take it easy on the adulterers, right? He, he's, he, he's not just, say, yes, he's saying that, but he's not just saying that. What, what he's really saying is like, this what is happening right now is a process in which a culture or a community, a group of angry people are, are scapegoating this woman who, yes, okay, she was an adulterer. She made a mistake. Okay, big deal. And they're attempting to cleanse themselves by attacking this woman. And, what, and so that, that's the point that I, I think, at least, what Jesus is saying is that this is a process, right? And you have to step back from the process and realize your own part in it, right? No, nobody's, uh, nobody's, uh, you know, sin free. You could say in a simple way, where where we have all at one time or another engaged in cancel culture. So when we talk about it, like ah, oh, cancel culture is so bad. I mean, I had to look in the mirror and, and look at myself and see all the times in my life that I've done things that are you know, quote unquote, cancel culture to other people. And, you know, you get, you get to be honest with yourself. And then once you do that, you can really step back and not so much like, like to me, like, I don't like talking bad about individual people, but I have no problem talking bad about something like cancel culture. Cause it's a, it's a cultural thing. It's a, it's an abstract formation. So I, I think it's never helpful to say like, you know, Joe Smith or, Donald Trump or whoever is a is a jerk for doing cancel culture. It's it's better to critique the system itself, you know, and and how we are all part of it. Well, and not just the system, but the whole process. Because as I'm listening, um, two words are coming out: projection and displacement. Two basic psychological defense mechanisms that um, 
the, the people, for example, that wanted to stone the adulterer, you know, and I think Jesus, when he said you, who was out of sin, but, you know, even if you hadn't actually committed the act of adultery, but that you played it out in your mind and that you, so, so and now you're going to project the guilt you have. Sure. And, and now you are, you know, you are better than the other. Sure. And, and so you can walk away. And then the displacement, if they've been, um, you know, in any way been uh, attacked or offended, they have to now to maintain their egos because it's really we're getting down to really basic spiritual. Uh, sure. Oh, sure. The, the I mean, ego, can, can, right. cancel, can, cancel culture is a very dark spiritual process. It's it's not simply a technological or political process. It goes to the very that's that's why. I keep bringing up this term anthropological. It's a, it goes to the heart of what it means to be human. It's, it goes right to the core of humanity. I mean, with societies, I mean, e like look at like, even take something like Marx's critique of capitalism. When you look at Marx's critique of capitalism, what he's basically saying is that there's a whole underclass, the whole, what, what he termed the proletariat, the industrial worker that's being canceled by their, their whole life, they're made to work, you know, 15 hours a day in these horrible factories in Northern England or wherever, in Lowell, Massachusetts, and they're living these horrific lives. They're, they're, they're being alienated from their labor. They're not making money. I mean, I'm not necessarily saying Marx was correct in what we should do in terms of, you know, communism, but I think Marx was, was correct in the sense that he, like, what these people went through like you know like my great grandfather you know a poor irish immigrant who came to south boston in 18 i mean what the, these these people's lives were were canceled right and that's what i so what, what i'm trying to say is that cancel culture is something that's just it's there it's always there it's always been there whether it be in you know 19th century england when marx was writing or whether it was, you know i mean oh my god Cusco, peru incas i mean oh my goodness Talk about cancel oh culture. God, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, I, that, I mean, always, I mean the, it's, right. it's a sac I mean, the Incas were a fundamentally sacrificial culture. I mean, they it was a fundamentally organized around sacrifice. That's that's cancellation, right? Sacrifice right. Is, a, is a cancellation. So that's that's what we're dealing with. It's it's we and shouldn't see right. It wasn't it ironic that that Pizarro comes on land with twenty six conquistadors and wipes them out. I mean, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, sure, like sure, 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 sure. A self-fulfilling prophecy, you know. Um, yeah, you know the the the, the predator gets eaten. Um, sure, 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 sure. And 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 that's one of the things too. That's one of the things too. Like white, a, a lot of, let's say, for lack of a better term, white liberals have this almost fantasy that um, all indigenous cultures and in wherever North America or South America were like these like perfectly harmonious. Yeah. You know, like no, no violence, and like, and and and, and like, and you know, like the white people from Europe. I mean, th this is not to defend at all the violence of colonization of of colonialization, because it is true that the white that white Europeans did engage in systematic extermination of the indigenous population. However, they were no angel. I mean, nobody's an angel. Exactly. That's that. That's the point. Nobody's an like exactly. none of us are angels. Not none of us are angels. None of us. Exactly. None of us. Yeah. You know, I I've had this. Con that's why I'm laughing. So uh, 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 I, I was I, I was just watching a speech by Slavoj Žižek, who's a contemporary philosopher and psychoanalyst, and and what he said it was great. He's like this this nonsense that you know, like UNESCO and, you know, these kind of big global organizations propagate like these kind of, this kind of global har har harmony culture. And he's like, no, all cultures, whether it's in Africa or Asia or indigenous or, you know, white European, they all have their bodies in the closet. All of them. Yes, yes. You know, they, they, they all have their, their yes. cancellation. They all have their cancellation, their cancel culture. Yeah. So that's that's basically what we have to think about. And, you know, I, I think the, the 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 best way to critique cancel culture is not engage in it, whether it be an online exactly. or, or yep. whether it be in our own personal lives. And, and I and then, to make that, and then, right, and, I and, that, and then uh, go ahead. And then no. And, and then most importantly is like when we see somebody else being canceled, we we come to their defense, you know, because yep. it's like. It's like, he, here's the thing. It's like, 
a perfect example is that kid. I forget his name. He was actually from Braintree, my hometown, uh, which made me feel even more sympathetic to him. But that, that kid from Braintree a few days ago who threw the bottle at Kyrie Irving. Okay, yes, of course he shouldn't have thrown the bottle. But it's like, you know something? The kid's 21 fucking years old. Who gives a fuck? He threw a bottle. I mean, yes, it was stupid. Yes, he shouldn't have done it. But my God, does he deserve to be treated like he's some uh, Nazi war criminal that he just, you know, did this horrific act? I mean, first, and, and you know, by the way, who really likes Kyrie Irving? He's, he's like, uh, he, you know, he's stepping on uh, the, the Lucky's head and, you know, he's, he's, he was so rude to the Boston fans. Again, I'm not saying he shouldn't, have, he should have got a, a water bottle thrown in him. But the point is that, Yes, people do stupid things, but it's like we all do stupid things, right? And like my my whole thing is like like the like it's easy to cancel. Like, how easy is it when somebody does a stupid thing for a hundred people to jump on and you know beat them up or yell at them or tell them how stupid they are or how racist they are, whatever? It takes a real man to say, you know, leave the kid alone, whatever. He made a mistake, he shouldn't have done it. You know what I mean? And that's and that's the point um of 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 cancel culture you know, so it's, it's I, like yeah it, it's 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 completely stupid it's completely disgusting but at the same time it's there and it's always been there and it's never not not been there and um you know and if it keeps going the way it's going it's gonna be bad i mean it's this is we're we're in dangerous water right now and you know this is um I, I think I mentioned Thomas Hobbes earlier, you know, he was the, the English philosopher that theorized that like the basic state of nature is this kind of like collect this collective sacrifice, this collective cancel culture when everyone's fighting each other. And that's what we're heading towards right now. We really are. We're heading towards this kind of Hobbesian digital technological cancel culture. And the only way, and we, we can't put the brakes on it through political or technological means. We can only put the brakes on it through spiritual or anthropological or some kind of raising of consciousness. That's, that's how we stop it. So we, we can only stop it by examining our own behavior and stopping it in our own lives before we get to the political level. Well, you know, I, you know, I thought once in a while, I don't get onto Facebook often, but it, it seems uh, in some synchronous way, whenever I do, there's a post by you and I, t- I could take the greatest delight in them because they're always so, uh, um, you know, so incisive. And, um, you know, in what I've seen in by our podcast and by reading your books uh, and watching your um, evolutionary process, as I see it, is, you know, first of all, uh, analyzing the situation, declaring, describing the processes of, um, globalization and gentrification, describing what they do, not so much judging at first, but then, uh, you know, starting to, after the analysis to, to hypothesize, well, if this continues, where are we going? And it, it's always frightening where it, not only will it go, but where it is going. And then lately to see you taking the stand that you are now, and I'm so glad that you're doing it in this podcast, you're saying the, the only way out of this is exactly what you're saying. You, 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 why don't you talk a little bit about the shaman? What music are we going to listen to? The, the song of the shaman or the industrial uh, globalization capital uh, humming that we're seeing from technology? Yeah, so that are you are you talking about that post that I wrote a couple months ago yeah, about about yeah, that? Yeah. Well, I, I in, in that post, I just to briefly summarize what I was saying is that you know just because I live in Peru and I and I'm you know I I, I come in contact with indigenous cultures quite a bit, and the there's a song or that that's used in in a ceremony in the jungle called an Icaro, and it's just kind of like a primal. Um, spiritual song you could say and i i compared that as being like the most elementary form of human language to the opposite which is like code which is the language that undergirds silicon valley and the entire you know global digital culture and like the difference is unbelievable because icaros are so they're so symbolically open and they have such healing potential whereas code is essentially putting humanity into like this kind of techno capitalist prison where no one can even move and like everyone's glued to their phones and everyone's 
kind of, uh, you know, like forced into this repetition of constant capitalist productivity. So, I mean, that's what I was getting at is that, you know, we, I, I think as time goes on, humanity has this kind of almost linguistic choice between, you know, going in further and further into this kind of techno capitalist hell or somehow breaking out and finding new forms of language, new forms of intersubjectivity. And of course that would mean breaking free from something like cancel culture. Yeah. And, and going more into spirit, into self. Yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, of course. Exactly yeah. Exactly what you're yeah. saying. And that's, you know, that has evolved. I mean, again, what a, a lot of times in the earlier discussions, you know, it seemed like a, we were heading toward a dystopia and there was no, um, no remedy, no, no outlet, no salvation. But, you know, what I'm hearing from you lately is this is what, you know, this, it's like with Kierkegaard in Fear and Trembling. He talks about you finally come to the cliff and there's nowhere to go. And that's where you have to take when it comes to faith, you have to take that giant leap of faith. There's no other choice. Sure. Sure. And so it seems now that that's where we're coming. And I, from a personal level, I, you know, I think I'm a couple of months ahead of what we're talking about now, because that's, you know, I, I can get, <laughs> it doesn't take much to get me going, especially when all my life, I grew up in the inner city, I grew up in Roxbury, I grew up as a minority in a black neighborhood. I saw the bullying, the, you know, whether it was in the Catholic school I went to or outside the Catholic school, but it was, it was, you know, it was a hen house, you know, just how the hens pick, they, there's a pecking order. Sure. And, and, Cancel and, culture. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And as a kid, I, you know, you start to uh, analyze things about yourself and what it is. And first of all, I mean, standing from this standpoint, I started to ask questions. Why? What was it about my life that I was born into that violence? I mean, violence on the streets, violence in the school. I mean, uh, you know, it was no secret that the nuns and the priests were pretty damn quick with their hands as well. Everybody used corporal punishment. And, you know, and, and at times, you know, in my house, my father wasn't too afraid to, to lay it out. And, you know, and I, it always bothered me from the deepest part of my spirit to see that that was the answer, that people beat other people. And so I, for some reason, I was always the guy between the bully doing what just you said a few moments ago to stand between the, the cancel culture and say, hey, wait a minute. You know, if you want to take him on, you know, you got to deal with me. And um, because, you know, the, I don't know, but that's how my consciousness evolved. And so what I see now is horrific. You're right. And and because People aren't taking analysis. I, I just did a, a podcast with uh, Robert Coopersmith, who did an article for the Epic Times, and he talked about natural theater. And I know you're a playwright, so you might appreciate what he was saying is that uh, he was talking about the theater of the absurd, the crazy uh, theater that, that somehow on the forefront and getting approbation from critics and everything else. And there was one with a bunch of drug um, pushers in a, you know, really funked out apartment. In the final scene, they're mutilating a child. And this is getting all kinds of uh, accolades as, oh, this is, this is brave theater. This is, you know, there's a statement here, blah, blah, blah. And uh -huh. so his thing is, wait a minute, why don't we get back to uh, what he called natural theater. He At one time he called it uh, con conservative theater, but he started to get canceled because he used conservative. So he said, w w why don't we get back to the theaters like uh, Oedipus? Why don't we go back to the Greek tragedies? Why don't we go back to Shakespeare where we, where the heroes are true heroes? And instead of, you know, de degenerating more and more into um, uh, on this dystopic world. And so I think, you know, that's what we have to kind of return to, don't we? Um, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I have no answers, man, about what I, I, I'm just like everybody else trying to figure it out. But I, I do think that, you know, obviously um, mutil mutilating a human being probably isn't a good thing to do. Uh, call me old fashioned, call, call, call me old fashioned, <laughs> especially a child. Yeah, call, call me old fashioned, and, and also I, I don't think it's it's uh 
it's you know progressive or interesting or aesthetically um, aesthetically um, interesting at all. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I think a lot of that stuff is stupid. Uh, But but yeah, I mean, you know, I I think that's um, what we're dealing with right now. Again, people remember people engage in the act of cancellation, the more self frustrated they are, the more the more. And, you know, the the society that the the, the capitalist world order, it produces so much competition and so much, you know, not just you know, dissatisfaction with our jobs and our position from being bombarded all day with advertising and memes and always feeling like we're less than it also produces a sense of kind of self-loathing because we always feel like we're not good enough. I have to stop you you because that's the word he used over and over. I was getting that. I mean, like if self-loathing. Yeah. I mean, so if, if we live in, if you live in a culture or society where, you know, 50% of the people are, you know, hate themselves or hate, not not hate themselves, but like hate where they are in life and they hate and they're frustrated and they're angry and they want more, they want a better car, they want more money, a better job, then of course they're going to, they're going to engage in cancellation because the reason why they're going to do that is because they want to be free from all those negative feelings. So um, American culture is a um, it's an incubator of cancel culture. It's an incubator. You, you, you find it much less so down in Peru, way less. Yes, oh, of course, yeah. a little bit because we're all human. But the culture of Peru is much calmer and it's much more centered around the family. And it's much more uh, you, you, you don't have like 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 the, the, the situation in America is so unbelievably competitive and so intense. And the media environment or the, the ambiance is so just really disgusting and 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 and, and so um yeah it's intru- it's, a, it's it's an it's, eye- it's, it's, it's 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 just so intrusive in in making you want things that you don't have that it, exactly. it of course of, of of course something like cancel culture will will emerge from that kind of collective dissatisfaction because like i said before cancel culture is an act of self purification that's that's what it is it's, an, it's, a, it's a collective act of self-purification where we try to rid ourselves from our own negative feelings by projecting them onto the scapegoat of the victim. Absolutely. You, you, you know, I've been down there and I love the Latin culture. First of all, at the core of it is family. And, it, and if you see, you know, the difference in, you can go to a restaurant and a lot of times they don't go out to eat till nine or 10 o'clock at night and their children are always with them. And the children uh, know their place in what I mean by that. They're not, <laughs> they're not like a lot of American kids who, uh, uh, I, I noticed it when I would be down there and I, how calm the children were. And when as soon as they got back into an American airport, the whining, the crying, you know, begging for that, that doll in the gift shop or something and the parents trying to control it. And it, it, it's a stark contrast. And so because I think they, the family unit, everybody nurtures. Well, you know, I, I think I sent you a few clips from just starting to read um, character by, um, oh God, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now, but um, great screenwriter. And he, he's talking about nature versus nurture. You know, I mean, uh, it, it, uh, what is human nature? Is it uh, is it formed by the fact that we are human and that there are human traits that we possess, which is interesting because to me, there's a part of cancel culture that wants to deny humanity, deny that there's a common humanity, that it seems to me, and maybe you can help me out with this, that they want to say, no, no whatever I say humanity is, whatever I decide that I am, and, and I'm right. And so once, once you start to build those barriers around you, it's harder and harder to connect and more canceled culture comes out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's a spiral for sure. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a spiral. And that's why the only way you can get out of it is by, completely not doing it i mean well, you can't you 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 can't win cancel culture no because it's a it's an eternal exactly. it's an it's, it's an eternal process right Just, and being, it's a it's tit, tit for tat and i've had to you know i'm glad we're talking this way because i find myself less and less drawn into it and in fact i make a conscious effort every day 
you know, one of the best expressions I've ever heard was where the attention goes, the energy flows. And you can't c- contest that statement. It's absolutely true. And so you have to then decide where do you put your attention? And if, if you jump into it, even though in, if somebody, when I was working at my buddy's dealership, so I, you know, I could get to see what people were reading as they were in the waiting room. And one book really struck my mind. And it's, I think, come to the forefront was the righteous mind. And that's, I think that's a, an essential element of this whole uh, cancel culture is the righteousness Oh my goodness. Feels. Well, of course. Well, of course. Of course. I mean, you can't, you can't know what cancel culture. Like, this is another point Gerard makes that I think is brilliant. It's like, you can't know what it is and do it. The, the reason why you do it is because you don't know you're doing it. Like the people right. who are, in, or who are engaging in cancel culture don't know they're doing it. You know what I mean? Like they, that's why in the sure. gospel of Luke, Christ says, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yes. They don't know what they're they don't know what the fuck they're doing. They're, they're, yes. they're just with the, they're, they're just with the mob. And yes. they're just, and they're, and they're, yes. they, they're, they're, they're just, they're, they're, they're being consumed by a process. But anyway, well, I, I think that's, that's a good, uh, a good point for now to end. I, I think we, yeah, we've well, given people. A, I love it. Yeah. I, I think it was, uh, it was incisive, revealing and, and also um, you, you, you proposed a, a great solution and that's it folks, you know, just, you know, decide where you want to put attention, but the more you feed it, the, the, you know, it's flaming fi- fi- flames, you know, uh, yeah. it, it's fanning flames. It's going to in- increase. Brian, thank you so much. Always fun. Tom, always great talking to you, my friend. Okay. Enjoy the day. All right, brother. Bye.